Yep, there you go. Uh, I'll be moderating today's program, and we're so happy that you joined us for this immigration and naturalization program. Uh, the point of which is to introduce you to some of the immigration changes that we expect we will see under the new Biden administration, as well as any changes that might occur as a result of the easing of travel restrictions. And as we go through the program today, you're going to see that uh, there's going to be a collision of events, basically, that we, we expect will happen within the next probably 10 to 18 months. And for those of you who are joining us, if you have the need for immigration services, you really want to be poised and ready to, to uh, prepare your business for the possible influx of, uh, you know, a new and, and probably a more diverse workforce. So we'll get right into the program. The program is intended today to last for about an hour. Um, we'll be fortunate to um, have my, my partner, Manuela Mar Reyes, speak. We'll go back to my um, bio for just a moment. I'll tell you a little bit about me and Stevens and Lee I'm, and why I'm part of this program. Um, I won't take you through my entire biography, but I'm pleased to be here uh, because I'm very involved with the Scranton Chamber of Commerce. Victoria and Brianna and other chamber members who are on the call know that they see me in and out of the chamber building on a very routine basis. I've been a member of the Scranton Chamber Board for a number of years now. I currently chair the Scranton Lackawanna Industrial Cook. Building Company, and um, that's you know involved in economic development. So we're immersed in that in a big Join way. the meeting in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And in addition, along with Pete Danchak, I chair the Scranton Plan, which is another economic development and fundraising uh, platform within the Scranton Chamber of Commerce. And we work with brokers to bring businesses to the area. So as you can tell, I'm very passionate about economic development. And I think that this issue you're about to hear about today will um, allow us to combine immigration and economic development in a way that will enhance the workforce in Northeastern Pennsylvania. I am a trial lawyer by background. Um, I'm part of a commercial law firm, as I'll explain in just a moment, and I serve in various roles, not just as a lawyer, but I also serve as an arbitrator, uh, particularly in construction and um, commercial disputes for the American Arbitration Association. So next slide, please. And I'll allow my partner, Manuela, who practices in our Princeton office, to introduce herself. Good morning. So uh, my name is Manuela Moraes. I am a uh, fairly new to Stevens and Lee. I, our practice joined the firm in uh, mid-November. Um, I am a corporate immigration attorney. I have been practicing corporate immigration law for uh, almost 30 years. Um, I started out um, from law school working at Pepper Hamilton, uh, then had the opportunity to start the immigration practice at Blank Rome, where I was there for 11 years. Um, and then decided to uh, go out on my own. Uh, I had my own practice for six years and uh, recently made the decision to join Stevens and Lee. Um, we are, uh, as I mentioned, the corporate immigration firm. Um, I specialize uh, in working with small businesses, Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies, and bringing over their uh, foreign workforce and obtaining permanent residency. I also have a strong background in uh, compliance and I-9 and E-Verify, um, and uh, I'm very, very happy to, to, to be here today um, to speak with you about some of the changes that have already happened uh, with the transition of um, uh, you know, the administration from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, and then to also kind of give you a little bit of a glimpse of what we anticipate seeing in the next year or so with respect to the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021. Okay, the next few slides are intended to just show you the depth of Stevens and Lee's practices and the location in which we practice. Um, Manuela Moraes is involved in a unique and uh, discreet uh, subject matter area. Uh, mine is a little bit broader when it comes to commercial litigation, but we have about 180 lawyers firm wide, and that's throughout the region, um, with some of us in northeastern Pennsylvania. And we handle everything from business formation to business dissolution and everything in between, but you name it, bankruptcy, mergers and acquisitions, immigration, as Manuela is about to describe today. Um, we have lawyers who had other careers as professionals before joining the firm. Uh, one of them, for example, is a hydrogeologist, so we do environmental work as well. And so um, it's important for you to know that 
Stevens and Lee has this breadth and depth of practice, but we're also here in Northeastern Pennsylvania and very other, there are very few other firms who can actually uh, say that they're located here in Northeastern Pennsylvania with this sort of a broad uh, platform. Next slide, please. Here is a, a slide that depicts the locations of our offices. You can see a couple of those dots in the upper right-hand corner. And they're located there because we have an office here in Scranton right on Courthouse Square with lawyers who like me practice in civil litigation, lawyers who handle municipal and tax exempt finance work. But we're also located in uh, six other states. Uh, we have an office in Wilkes-Barre as well for those who um, you know, are not familiar with Stevens and Lee. Next slide, please. And then our practice areas are listed on this slide. I'm not going to take the time to go through all of them. I've already mentioned some of them. Um, healthcare is a big one. Manufacturing is another that I'm not sure is even on this list, but we represent a lot of manufacturers. And that's important because immigration issues are going to become important to, if they're not already, uh, companies that are involved in manufacturing and certainly healthcare um, entities. So the point of these slides, and you can move to the next one, Manuela, is to show you that our firm has um, a unique subject matter expertise in lots of different commercial areas. We are here in your market, unlike other firms, other large firms just are not here in the market. And Manuela will explain during the presentation how she helps businesses like yours when it comes to immigration and naturalization issues. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Manuela. And if you use your chat feature to ask questions during today's presentation, I'll be sure to ask Manuela those questions as they arise so that they are topical. Okay, thank you, Marianne. So I think uh, it's fair to say that the last four years have been quite a roller coaster ride, um, not only you know, due to COVID, um, but certain restrictions, embassy closures, travel bans, um, and also because of you know, the, the executive orders and changes posed by the Trump administration that have led up to uh, multiple lawsuits. Um, it has been a very interesting four years to be an, an immigration attorney. As I mentioned, I've been practicing for 30 years and the last four years have been uh, quite uh, uh, interesting to say the least. Um, today, I think we are going to look at some changes, uh, both imminent uh, changes that, um, and things that have already occurred under the Biden administration, and also look at the US Citizenship Act and, and give you some guidance on what we think is going to happen. Um, it'll be some time before anything happens with the US, uh, the US Citizenship Act. Um, only because it does have to go through committee and then get approval by both houses. And, you know, given that the U.S. Citizenship Act is quite bold uh, in terms of the, um, you know, what, what it is hoping to accomplish, um, we, we do foresee that there will be, you know, um, a lot of pushback in terms of getting um, certain, um, certain things done um, in a timely fashion. But, um, you know, it, it, it is interesting. Uh, I mean, one of the first things that President Biden uh, did was um, to uh, appoint uh, Alejandro Mallorcas as the uh, Director of Homeland Security. And for those of us who practice immigration, we are very familiar with, um, with him. Um, he actually served as the uh, Deputy Secretary um, and U.S. Director under the Obama administration. So we have some, some guidance in terms of, uh, you know, things that he put into place in terms of memorandum and direction for the agency. And I think it's really going to set the tone for the next four years um, in terms of, uh, you know, policy and how we can anticipate adjudication of cases and, um, you know, the, 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 the overall, um, you know, experience with immigration, um, not only for practitioners, but also for employers and also for employees. So um, today, I, I basically want to cover uh, a couple of, of key issues or um, things that I think in, in, from a practical standpoint that you should be um, on the lookout for if you do have immigration. Um, and the first one are fee changes. So um, under the President, of, uh, President Trump's administration, 
uh, there were supposed to be very significant ch uh, fee changes um, with respect to filing fees. So when you file an, an, you know, an application with integration, um, there is a, 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 a relevant uh, filing fee that has to be filed. And some of these fees were going to increase 20% um, or more. And um, they were going to add new fees. And, um, you know, again, for anyone who does immigration, immigration and bringing over a foreign national, hiring a foreign national can be expensive, uh, particularly if you're hiring, lo you know, local counsel and um, given the, uh, you know, the uh, magnitude or the volume of you know, foreign nationals that you have. Um, but um, we, um, we, we um, were told, and it is now the case, that no fee increases will take place as of right now. But the reason that I'm bringing this up right uh, to you today and with the first slide um, is that because of the Biden administration and the changes that they are proposing, that it's very likely that fees will increase at some point. So if you have um, ex you know, extensions, fees extensions, um, up, um, individuals that you're looking to file for permanent residency, um, it may make sense for you to take a look and try to pre-plan and you know, have those cases filed before these fee increases take place. So we don't know when it will take place, but um, it, it, it most surely will um, happen sometime in, in the future. The second, um, the second point that uh, I think impacts employers are these presidential proclamations on international travel. So President Trump, in uh, and this is basically a, you know a chronological history of these presidential proclamations. Um, President Trump issued a series of proclamations that um, basically consist of the travel ban, um, so prohibiting uh, certain nationals of certain countries, most of Europe, the United Kingdom, Ireland, China, Iran, and Brazil from entering the United States due to COVID. That particular order is valid indefinitely and under the um, Biden administration um, is also, there's no plan to, to um, uh, you know, to make any changes. And as a matter of fact, uh, there is some consensus that the, um, the travel ban will be further extended until we have COVID under control. Um, in addition to that, President Trump also issued a proclamation suspending issuance of H-1B visas. So H-1B visas are you know, uh, specialty occupation visas. It's the catch-all for most um, professionals in the United States, including uh, computer professionals, doctors, um, you know, um, in the IT industry, managers, it, it's basically the catch-all. Um, L-1 visas, um, H-2Bs are the agricultural workers. Uh, L-1 visas for multinational executives and managers that were coming over or individuals who are starting um, companies in the United States. Um, so L-1A is for managers, executives, L-1B is for people who have specialized knowledge and then certain J-1 um, non-immigrant visas. When I say things were, you know, a roller coaster ride. I mean, we had this this ban in place. Um, we then had some directive from the Department of State that, oh, well, if you have, you know, an H and L and J one, H two B, you can apply for this national interest exception. The problem is that the Department of State didn't give any guidance to uh, consulates abroad. So each consulate was sort of trying to figure things out and, and trying to apply just a general framework of what this national interest exception uh, would do. And um, there were, uh, in our office, um, I'm gonna take it to the next slide. In our office, between August, 2020 and January, 2021, um, we uh, were very successful in getting uh, several national interest um, exceptions uh, to this particular travel ban. The problem now is that the consulates are inundated with these requests. Um, and there are consulates like London, for instance, where it's almost impossible because they have so many requests 
and you have to meet very strict criteria. One of them is that you know, there's a hardship to the company, a financial hardship. You have to show that the person can't do their job from abroad. And right now everyone's remote. So there are very few cases where you can actually make a valid argument that the person has to be here in the United States. But we have had um, multiple cases, um, and just to give you, an, you know, a sense of you know, how different these concepts vary in terms of processing, we had one particular case in Switzerland a couple of days ago, we got a response in five days. Um, and we have had uh, you know, a manufacturing, we represent a, uh, a very large um, Fortune 500 glass manufacturer um, who um, has, has two um, um, manufacturing plants that are being built uh, trying to bring over key workers, specialized workers um, that you know, really had the expertise um, that, that was needed for the installation of equipment and so forth. Um, that has been going back and forth for many months um, and completely inconsistent. So, you know, one group, they will issue it for the next group, they won't. So um, it, this is a problem and it will continue to be a problem. Now, the thing is with these international, um, you know, proclamations, um, President Trump did in fact, um, you know, uh, rescind the, the, the restricted travel from, you know, the, the travel ban. So people were, um, you know, really happy. And, you know, there were tons of people already starting to make, uh, foreign nationals already starting to make plans to get a consular appointment to come in. Uh, that was on January 18th. Uh, as soon as President Biden entered office, he issued a new proclamation that basically reinstated the travel ban. And again, the travel ban is different than the suspension of the H's and L's. Uh, travel ban right now is valid indefinitely until President Biden uh, and his administration feel that COVID is under control. Um, and it is suspected that President Biden will um, you know, at some point, take a look at the suspension of the H's, the L's, the J's, the H2's, um, which uh, only are only in effect until the end of March. And there is, you know, some discussion and consensus that that would be rescinded. So, for for anyone um, on on this call today, on this presentation, that have foreign nationals that are abroad, uh, I think the takeaway is that you know, uh, the travel ban will continue. There are ways around it um, for those who have H's and L's and J's and H2B's. Um, you know, March 30th is a key date for you. Um, and if you haven't already tried a, a national interest exception, um, we would be more than happy to speak with you, share our experiences with you to see if there's any way that we can help get a, 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 an earlier visa appointment. Um, and possibly have that person enter as soon as possible. Manuela, before you move on to the next topic, let me add that there's a comment in the chat. I think that we have actually with us the highest ranking member of the Polish National Catholic Church, if I'm not mistaken. And so he's interested in hearing during your presentation today, whenever it's appropriate, about whether there are any religious worker exceptions um, or um, religious worker immigration policies that are unique to uh, religious uh, travelers. And okay. you don't have to address it now, but I'd like it to come up at some point. Sure. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll do that later, um, because that is actually, I believe, part of the uh, U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021. I believe that there is a provision there re relating to religious workers. Um, and But I will, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. And if, if you know, if we can, I will, I will like to follow up just to confirm that, that I'm 100% accurate. There's a lot of information in that particular act. So we don't really know what's going to, um, you know, ultimately be part of the, of the, you know, the law once it, if it, if in fact does pass, but I believe that there is a provision in there for religious workers. Very good. Thank you. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, I mean, this, you know, for anyone who has foreign nationals that are abroad, um, you know, the, uh, the Biden administration has uh, restricted travel directly into the United States from certain countries. Um, a lot of our clients had been um, 
um, you know, instead of applying for a waiver to, to travel directly into the US, uh, we had had some success in sending people to countries that were not on the travel ban and quarantining there for 14 days and then applying for entry, um, assuming that they already had a visa and, you know, they didn't otherwise have to um, go to the consulate to get a, you know, their initial L or H's. Um, again, this is like something that's ongoing and, and um, you know, it has really had an impact on immigration um, in, you know, for, for several months now. And it is really going to be interesting to see once, you know, COVID is a thing of the past, which hopefully, you know, will happen at some point, um, to see how quickly the consulates actually get up to speed in, 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 in hey, adjudicating cases. Morning, right now, there's probably about a year backlog for most cases. Okay. Can you take us very quickly through the steps, Manuela, that you're currently right. taking on behalf of your clients to deal with these international travel restrictions? Just give us an example of, you know, the services you provide and what an employer can expect if they're encountering these um, sorts of um, interruptions. Right. So as I mentioned, I mean, we, we have uh, one of the biggest projects has been working with a glass manufacturing uh, company that we represent. Um, they have had, um, I think, basically about 30 um, individuals who, um, who, uh, who needed to come in um, to make sure that, you know, the equipment was set up properly and to make sure that there's, you know, that there, there uh, you know, the, the construction was, um, you know, in, in line with, um, you know, their, um, you know, the regulations and so forth. So um, we, we have been working with this particular company for several months, um, you know, a, a, a normally a, a natural interest exception, you know, can, can be in the range of, you know, three to $5,000, depending on how difficult it, it is to bring someone into the United States and how cooperative the, the, uh, the consulate has been. Um, you know, on the other hand, we've had great experience with Italy and we've had a great experience with Switzerland and we've had some experience, um, you know, not great, but, you know, positive in, in Brazil. So um, the cost of doing something like this uh, would really only make sense if it was someone that was like very, very high up in the company and where we could establish that there was no way that the person could actually perform their work um, from abroad, that there was a necessity to have the person physically here in the United States, either touring the facility or you know, going out into the field or whatever whatever the situation is um but the cost of it can be you know can be prohibitive for some for, for some people particularly if you know if you know as of march 30th this is going to be lifted um but i know companies do have people that they need here you know immediately um even new hires so if this is something that you know anyone on this call today is interested in knowing more about and whether or not you have someone that would fit the criteria to apply for a national interest waiver, um, you know, please feel free to call me. I'm happy to speak with you and give you my opinion as to whether or not based on the, you know, the person's qualifications, their proposed job duties, and then also the consulate, whether it makes sense. And you're the individual who works with the, the consulates for the various other countries? I'm sorry? Are you the individual then who works with the consulates for the various other countries? Yes, um, we, we, our office works directly with the consulates. And in some instances, like for this project, I mean, we've even had to call in, you know, congressional assistants, senator's office, the governor's office. I mean, we are, we, we really try to think outside the box and, 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 and pull in as many resources as we can to make sure that we, you know, that we provide the best case possible. Because quite frankly, I mean, all of these consulates are getting the same request. You know, this is, it's a hardship to the company. This person has to be there, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you really have to make an argument that you, you know, you stand out and depending on the financial burden to the company, 
Uh, you know, for this glass manufacturer, for instance, I mean, building these two manufacturing plants in two different states is going to create multiple jobs in the United States. It's going to have an, an economic benefit to the to the United States and to U.S. workers. So, you know, we we do um, take these cases pretty seriously in terms of how we present them. And, you know, for the most part, you know, knock on wood, we've been successful. Um, but you know there there are there are, there are challenging cases um you know so anyone who has someone who's been abroad who may need some assistance i'm again happy to speak with them to go over what the person's going to be doing what position they hold what importance they have to the company in terms of being here and then figuring out if this is a good um solution based on the concepts response okay, let's move on now from the um COVID-related international travel restrictions to the next topic. Sure. So the next topic is really the H-1B the H-1B program. And the H-1B program, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the H-1B visa, it is um, a visa that is subject to a lottery system. Uh, we have uh, an annual limitation of 65,000 visas for individuals who um, are here in the United States who have bachelor's degrees, whether they've Earn them here or abroad. And then we have an additional 20,000 visas set aside exclusively for people who obtain their master's degree or higher in the United States. Um, generally, every single year, um, we go into H-1B filing season, which starts on April 1st, and we receive anywhere between 275,000 visas to over 300,000 visas in some years. And so what, what we anticipated happening this year what we anticipated happening this year was that um, the process was going to change. And, um, and we just found out uh, on February 4th that um, it is going to stay status quo for this year. So there were, um, the, the registration period will open uh, from March 9th until um, March, was it March 19th or 25th. Um, so 17 days, you have an employer can, can register um, via their My US, USCIS portal. Um, once the registration period closes, um, it'll go into a lottery system. If the case is chosen, um, you, you get confirmation in via email saying it's been selected. And then from that point, you have 90 days. You can file as early as April 1st, but you have 90 days in which to file an H-1B uh, petition. And if that person is approved, the, the um, employment date would not start until um, October 1st, which is the beginning of the fiscal year. What is the difference between the application that occurs in March and the petition that begins uh, effectively on April 1st? So the, the, the March is just the registration. So everyone will register whatever H-1B cases they have. So if you have um, individuals who are students who have, um, you know, who are on OPT, optional practical training, which is something that they get for a year after they conclude their studies, they would file on, 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 um, on, on, in March, right? They would be registered. And then once the registration closes, the cases are chosen, you get notification, and then you move ahead with the next step, which is filing the application as early as April, but no longer than uh, 90 days from the time that you're notified. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the changes that were supposed to take place were basically um, two different, um, two different um, scenarios. One was a wage-based selection process for H-1Bs. <coughs> and there was um, a final rule created on, on January 8th, 2021, that would basically um, indicate that um, anyone who filed an H-1B visa, the, the preference would be given to those cases where there was the higher wage. So for H-1B, for the H-1B program, it is subject to prevailing wages, um, anywhere from level one, which is an entry level to level four, so what, what was proposed was that, you know, anyone who had a, a higher wage 
would have first preference as to the H-1B visa and, and possibly being selected. Um, and we were biting our nails up until recently because we didn't, we weren't sure how this was going to work out. But on February 4th, um, USC announced that there was going to be a delay of the final rule until they were able to review it and comment and, you know, uh, make make edits or make new proposals to the to the uh, uh, selection process. And that is not going to affect this year's H-1B um, lottery. The second uh, changes that were proposed for the H-1B visa program this year was that um, there was there were going to be prevailing wage increases. So again, the Department of Labor, H-1Bs are subject to prevailing wages. Department of Labor has four different levels. Um, basically what, what was being done was they were taking level one, level two completely off the table. Your level three would be your level one. And then a four, you know, four would be level two, and then higher for level three, and higher for level four. So that was going to take place. It was, it was a final rule um, uh, entitled strength, uh, "Strengthening Wage Protections for Temporary and Permanent um, Employment of Certain Aliens in the United States." So this particular rule would not have only affected the non-immigrant, the temporary H-1B, but would also affect. Um, any case that was being filed for permanent residency under the labor certification process. Um, again, on, on January 1st, great news for us um, that the Department of Labor um, proposed to delay this final rule until May 14, 2021. So the takeaway from this is that if you have someone who uh, you're filing for an H-1B visa for, um, regardless of whether they are chosen or not, it may make sense for employers to, to file that prevailing wage if they're working on green card cases before May 14, 2021, before the, this may or may not, not take the place. And then also to obtain the prevailing wage um, for the H-1B visa. Um, most, I mean, you know, for H-1B visas, um, it, it, you, you do not need to file a prevailing wage request. Um, but in, in our case, for most of our employers, we are suggesting that we, we, we actually move ahead and do that. Um, and the problem there is you're running out of time because the prevailing wage, once you file it with the Department of Labor, can take anywhere from seven to 10 weeks. So um, if anyone has uh, labor certification cases, um, H-1B visas that they're going to be filing, um, you know, in registering in March, possibly filing in April, um, I think it would be, you know, my, you should be mindful that, uh, you know, you should do a prevailing wage now before the uh, increase takes place. Tell us, I'll give you one, Manuela, if you have an employer coming to you interested in obtaining H-1B visas for workers, um, what sort of services do you provide to help them through the application process, then the petition process, and then um, dealing with the prevailing wage issue that you just described? So, um, so our office, uh, it, you know, for our clients and for anyone who's interested in having us assist, we do help with the registration. We handle the registration for a very nominal fee. Um, and, um, and then if the case is chosen, uh, there's additional legal fee to prepare the application. So, you know, um, filing the LCA, um, you know, preparing the applications, um, making sure that it's timely filed, um, you know, preparing the public access file. Um, so we, we basically, um, for right now, we are, I mean, I think it's very nominal. We're charging $500 for the registration. And there are some companies that are, are more than comfortable in doing it themselves. Other companies, you know, just don't want to take the chance that they're not going to do it correctly. Um, and they're going to lose out on that window, that 14-day win or 17-day window that they may have to to register. And then once the registration is closed, like there's nothing more until next year. So you 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 will definitely have um, you know people who are an OPT that may have OPT or or an STEM extension uh, pursuant to OPT for a year or two. But you have to start thinking ahead because if you don't make it this particular H-1B season, you have 
hopefully another chance to file it next year. Um, so we also, you know, will we'll help employers with strategy, looking at like, you know, how many uh, OPT workers they have, how many H-1Bs they have to determine whether or not it makes sense to move forward with a filing this year or next year. So, and, now, and then also compliance. Um, for the H-1B visas, we do do a lot of um, public access file reviews because um, it was one of the other things that I looked at this morning. I mean, compliance is under the Trump administration was like up 400%. Um, and uh, we don't really see that being um, very different under this, this new administration um, because there are things that, you know, I think President Biden is going to want to, um, you know, propose and move forward with in terms of immigration reform. Um, and I think that there, there will have to be a give and take um, and compliance being one of them. So I don't think that com the compliance part's gonna go away. So in terms of the H1s, we can definitely help with the, with the filing, um, strat the strategy, and then also for any compliance issues that employers might have. Okay, and then for those who are curious, will the H1B visas that are issued be affected by the current travel restrictions? Yes, they will. So if, if it, un unless the person is here. So a lot of a lot of in individuals have optional practical training. So you can file a case and and depending on whether that person has what's called cap gap, they can continue to remain in the United States and their H-1B visas will automatically go into a, in, a effect on October 1st. But if you are applying for someone who is abroad for the first time getting an H-1B visa, that um, you know, that order that's supposed to, you know, kind of time out um, on March 30th that may be extended by the administration would have an impact. So those, those orders only impact people who are abroad um, or who are here and then have to travel abroad and they don't have a visa because I mean, we have lot, lots of clients who um, have H-1B visas um, or have had an H-1B visa, but for one reason or another, because of family issues or health issues or other personal issues have to leave. And once you leave, you're basically subject to those rules and, and those restrictions. Okay, so to summarize, before you move on to a discussion about DACA and how that may change under the Biden administration, um, for the clients that you represent in, uh, who are interested in the national interest waivers, and you're dealing with the COVID travel restrictions, you're saying that your service is all in, including dealing with the various governmental entities and the application process, the fees, et cetera, are all going to come in at up to $5,000. And then th is the same thing true with respect to the assistance that you provide to employers who are looking uh, to get through the H-1B visa application process? Um, so are, are, you, if, are you referring about the, the fees? The fees for... All in, uh, you know, there may be folks on this call who wonder if this is just too expensive a proposition for them ever to consider for their own businesses. Right. What sort of fees, uh, the fees and costs all in can you anticipate for an H-1B visa application? Right. Well, what I would say is, you know, immigration is also always an additional cost, uh, you know, that affects the bottom line. But, um, you know, if employers have H-1B, you know, prospects so they have students they hire students they are looking to you know do a first time h1 uh under this lottery system i mean what their their cost really is 500 dollars um to to see if they are registered and they get selected if they are selected then there is an additional um you know filing fee there are additional filing fees as well as legal fees associated with preparing and filing that application. So an H-1B visa, three-year H-1B visa, can be somewhere in the vicinity of $5,000, and that includes, um, you know, filing fees, which are approximately, you know, $2,500. Um, so you're, you're looking at, you know, spending about $5,000 for an H-1B visa. Um, but if you don't, if you, if you do the registration and the person doesn't get chosen under this 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 year's lottery, then it's really just nominal. It's the five hundred dollars that you know that you would do for the registration. 
Um, so yeah, and, and then, you know, hopefully the individuals are here and we don't have the, the, the national interest exception to be concerned about. Um, and again, I mean, that, that really should hopefully, um, you know, resolve itself uh, at the end of March, but then you also have the issue of embassies being able to actually have the capacity to interview people and issue the visas. Um, so it's it's going to take a while to to um, you know to clear up this backlog that's been created because of COVID, because of embassy closures, because of you know restrictions and you know everything else. So you know if if you have someone who you absolutely need here tomorrow, then the national interest exception is really your only you know, your only option right now, if they're abroad. Okay, thank you. Let's turn our attention now to the DACA program. Yeah, so DACA, I mean, um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this because, um, you know, obviously under President uh, Trump, this has gone through many, I mean, you know, many different cycles. Um, uh, DACA was, you know, is it's, um, the Deferred Action um, Childhood um, uh, arrivals under the Dreamers Act, um, and it provides employment authorization for uh, certain individuals who could show that they were here um, as children, attend school, or in the military, and through no fault of their own, found themselves here illegally. And so um, this DACA was uh, challenged in court many times by uh, President Trump, um, President Biden, uh, one of his first uh, actions was to issue a memorandum uh, directing the Department of Homeland Security uh, to take all actions he deems appropriate, consistent uh, to preserve and fortify DACA. And um, what this does is that it, <clears throat> it allows even first time uh, requests for DACA to be submitted. It also provides an uh, advanced parole which are, uh, allows it's a travel document that allows someone to travel outside the United States and come and come back in, um, and under uh, the uh, you know the, the the validity period, the grants of deferred action and employment authorization, um, the anticipation is that the employment authorization will be issued in two year increments. So I think that this will give some stability to employers who have um, individuals who are employed pursuant to DACA um, to, to make sure that, you know, they don't have any interruption in, you know, their business cycle or work. Um, because I think, you know, uh, for many employers, hiring someone from DACA and investing in the training, investing in the, in the individual, um, only to find out that it's here one day, not here the next day, can't be extended, um, is really problematic and, and you know, very, um, destructive in terms of business. But under the Biden administration, I think that DACA will be here to stay. All right, so for the sake of employers who may be on this call or part of this program, they should not be concerned about um, uh, hiring anyone with a DACA authorization. Right, and and for, for DACA, I mean, we, we normally, uh, at least in our office, we, we represent corporations. So we normally don't get, rep don't, get involved um, with the DACA application, although, you know, we've had employers who've asked us to be, you know, uh, part of, you know, the, the, the filing uh, process. Um, but DACA is a pretty straightforward um, application, usually filed by individuals. Where we come, come in um, is mostly on the, um, you know, the E-Verify um, I-9, part of it where they lose authorization but you know you know you know where are the options how do we document our nines how do we so that is something that you know we can certainly help with um, if anyone has any any uh, any questions regarding DACA extensions and uh, filing and how to document i nines um, and we may see some other changes in DACA that will present an opportunity for us to help employers in different ways. Um, but I think that the, the takeaway is that, you know, for employers who do have, um, you know, employees employed pursuant to 
uh, DACA that they're going to have longer periods of employment authorization, which should be less disruptive to their business. Okay, so the Scranton Chamber, as I mentioned, is very involved in economic development. And as part of that, it's focusing attention in recent years on equity and diversity. Um, and maybe this is something you can discuss offline, but is there a way for you to help or speak with the Scranton Chamber itself about approaching some of our immigrant communities to help the individuals with DACA applications, all for the sake of enhancing Northeastern Pennsylvania's workforce? Yeah, I think that that's a great idea, and I would be very happy to to do that. Um, I think that you know there there are essentially 115,000 DACA recipients. Um, most of them were precluded from filing an application previously. So we envision that there are going to be a lot of young people um, who you know for the first time will apply for DACA will have employment authorization, enter the workforce, go to school, uh, get you know, training and, and so forth. So um, I think that it, you know, any, anything that we can do to, uh, you know, to get information out there on you know, what, what the process is um, and you know, tie them back into the, the chamber in terms of uh, you know, possibly um, work opportunities that they may have with companies that are uh, members of the chamber, um, I think would be really helpful and I'd be happy to, to, to uh, brainstorm on that. Okay, great. Um, you have gone so far, Manuela, I believe, as to publish um, in Spanish, in Spanish uh, publications for the sake of bringing um, to the immigrant communities right. attention to some of these immigration issues, correct? Yes. So when I when I was in my when I had my own practice, um, you know, for the six years, the first two years, um, I actually did um, a lot of uh, advertising in, in in Spanish papers, um, and this this goes to also you know the the changes that might occur with illegal immigration. I mean, uh, you know, I had a lot of success in advertising. Um, you know, this is what the what what the law is. If you qualify, please reach out. Um, and I also did some advertising on advertising on um, advertising. Sorry about that. I don't know why this is so loud. Um, advertising with uh, Telemundo. Um, so that, that might be another option for employers who need, um, you know, certain types of workers, um, you know, to be able to recruit people in the future. Um, you know, um, I, 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 I mean, there are lots of other organizations, other, other um, newspapers, you know, um, that, that, you know, an employer could, could put ads in in terms of trying to reach, um, you know, particular types of employees. So, um, yeah, again, I'm happy to brainstorm on all of that um, and share my experiences on what worked and what didn't work for me in terms of reaching, um, you know, that particular population. Okay, so let's move quickly through the first 100 day priorities that we see on this screen so we can get to some discussion about the Citizenship Act and still allow a few minutes for questions at the end. Right. So a, a couple of things, uh, I think key things that happened and I actually wrote down some additional ones. So President Biden, uh, you know, as of, you know, almost immediately uh, revoked the proclamation ending the Muslim ban, um, preserved and fortified deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA that we just talked about, uh, reinstated deferred depart departure for Liberians, uh, terminated the construction of the wall and uh, diverted the funds that were um, basically um, uh, attributable to the building of the wall and also called for an assessment into related legal, administrative, and contractual issues relating to the building of the wall. Um, has put a freeze on any rule proposed by the um, past administration until um, the new administration has an opportunity to review and comment um, and, 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 and some other you know, key things, including again, um, making uh, Alejandro Malarcus a uh, part uh, or head of um, the Department of Homeland Security. 
Um, there's also um, some other things that um, uh, are not actually on here, including I didn't, I didn't do any of the religious workers, but I will take a look at that again. Um, but most importantly, on, on January 20th, I mean, we were not we were not ready for President Biden to make immigration like front and center. Um, so we were quite surprised that all of this happened so quickly. But on January 20th, 2021, uh, President Biden did send his U.S. Uh, Citizen, Citizenship, Citizenship Act of 2021 um, to Congress. And um, some key takeaways from that. Um, so one of the things that it's going to propose to do is to um, provide a roadmap, uh, which will be about an eight-year roadmap for people who are here undocumented. And I just looked at the statistics today, depending on the survey that you're looking at, um, there's an estimated, you know, 14.4 million to 20 million um, individuals here that are um, unauthorized. And it's kind of hard to come up with a definite number because obviously there's no way to, uh, you know, track or report um, you know, unlawful presence. Um, but what his uh, earned roadship to citizenship would do was is, is to make sure that people who have here here um, before um, January uh, 1st, 2021 uh, can, can step forward and uh, pay their taxes, show that they have no criminal record, undergo additional security checks and obtain a, like a conditional green card um, that they will then be able to convert over to U.S. citizenship at some point. Um, so that is going to be, I mean, a very, very hard sell, obviously, um, with the uh, Republicans. Um, I, but there are other things that I think that, you know, President Biden and, um, you know, and, and his administration will have to uh, also um, propose in terms of national security and investment in technology and possibly having employers, all employers use and verify. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how this is going to work. We don't really have a lot of clarity on how this is going to be rolled out, what's going to be involved, how this is going to work. But this is, this is monumental in terms of you know, Im immigration and, um, you know, for, for employers who obviously have uh, or in industries where illegal immigration is prominent, um, I would just say that you, you definitely should keep this on your radar, start talking to counsel regarding, you know, what that might mean for your business and, and whether or not there are things that, you know, that uh, as we find out more about this, um, you know, the, the Citizenship Act, whether or not there are people, you know, that that might benefit, uh, employees that might benefit from 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 filing uh, an application. The other thing that the um, Citizenship Act will do is um, bring, you know, help keep families together. So right now, for both employment and for family-based immigration, we have quotas. Um, what this Citizenship Act will do uh, or propose to do is to clear backlogs and recapture unused visas for uh, worldwide. So, you know, we, we have a system where we have, you know, hypothetically, we have a million green cards that we give out for family base and a million visas that we give out for, um, for employment. And those are subdivided between glo global, everyone, and then countries where we already have, you know, more than enough uh, nationals of that country because our immigration system is really based on diversity. So for nationals of India, nationals of China, nationals of the Philippines, nationals of uh, um, um, Mexico, there is a huge backlog. Um, I mean, in some instances for family immigration, it's 15, 20 years for employment. For an Indian national, it's 10 to 15 years. China, the same thing. So what this Citizenship Act will do is to try to reform the system, the priority-based system, to allow unused visas to be applied towards those countries, and then you know to allow people to move forward quickly or quick 
quicker to get their, their green cards. Again, we're not really sure how this is going to play out, how long it will take because of the massive back, uh, backlogs, but it will give people an opportunity to be able to get permanent residency and then also eventually, you know, once they have their permanent residency for five years, apply for US citizenship. Um, this Citizenship Act also wants to embrace diversity. So we have a, a, a lottery system, which is different from the H-1B lottery system, where it's a diversity lottery. And uh, what happens there is we, we have countries on this list where we feel like, okay, we, we do not have, you know, people of this particular country represented or well represented in the US. Um, so, you know, for, for countries that we have quotas for, they're clearly not on the list, but anyone else, um, you know, any other country will be put on this list. It comes out every year. There is a, 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 an enrollment period, you file an application. And if you meet certain criteria, including education, clearance, you, know, you have no background, criminal background, and you meet, um, you know, other uh, criteria in terms of your employment and so forth, you can be issued a green card. So what this bill, um, this act would do is actually increase the diversity visas every year from 55,000 to 80,000 visas. Okay, and you mentioned that these are separate from the H-1B visas. So while the H-1B visas may be limited to 65,000, the number of diversity uh, visas, which is separate, will increase to 80,000. Right, so the H-1B visa is, is non-immigrant. It's a temporary visa. It only allows uh, someone to come here to work in the United States. And it, there are exceptions and there are other rules that come into play in terms of you know, starting a green card process and where you are in the green card process. Um, but normally an H-1B visa is valid for six years. Um, so you can be here and work for, you know, and it's employer specific as well. This particular diversity visa um, is is based on um, nationality and it's for the green card. You actually get a green card. So you may not even have an employer in the United States, you may not have family in the United States, no connection to the United States, but you file this and a lot of young people actually get their, 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 their green cards this way. Um, and it happens every single year, I believe in September. Okay, so we understand from what you told us that the U.S. Citizenship Act will be enacted, or we expect that it will be enacted. It's been, um, you know, pushed to Congress at this point. Um, do you have an expectation that the act will become effective within two years of the date of the inauguration? In other words, before the next, uh, you know, general election, at which we'll see a, a large turnover of our congressional and Senate representatives. Well, I think that that's the hope. I think that um, depending on, I mean, it is going to, I think the Republicans are going to want to have some safeguards here, including, um, again, possibly having every employer use E-Verify um, to, um, you know, to verify the, the workforce going forward, having greater penalties for people who enter illegally, um, having um, even, I mean, even this, you know, this, this, particular, um, you know, bill would, you know, is looking at possibly having pre-clearance centers in countries where we have a history of people entering and then not returning. That's part of the problem. The problem is that we have no, you know, way to monitor people who enter the United States and how long they stay. So, you know, one of the things that they're looking at is instead of having the person travel to the United States, and seek clearance and entry into the United States once they're here physically in the United States, possibly having that done abroad. Um, and I would imagine that you know one of the criteria for you know getting a visa to begin with is you know having to show strong financial ties. So you know they may you know they may need to strengthen those you know those uh, you know criteria. You know what family ties do you have? What you know do you have a job? Do you to make sure that whatever, if the person is actually entering, that there is a good chance that that person is going to go back. Um, they also have to, I think, you know, in order to get this passed, I think that they'll have to really invest in smart technology, you know, at our airports, you know, make sure that their additional clearance is done. Right now, when someone applies for a visa, they go through biometrics 
and you know it's cleared by the FBI. But I think that they're going to have to do something more to make sure that our, our you know people coming into this country, you know, they're coming in as you know safely, and there is you know there there's a framework that will allow us to control immigration, and 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 you know, and I think that. One of the things that, uh, you know, that I think they really need to look at and address are, you know, what are the root causes of migration? You know, how are we going to fix this so that if we do, you know, allow, you know, uh, 14, 20 million people to obtain permanent residency that are here un un unlawfully, um, you know, how do we prevent this from happening again? I think that that's going to be like the the struggle. So. It depends on it depends on the back and forth. It depends on whether they can come to terms. But I think that they have a good opportunity to to make this work um, if there's you know some compromise on both sides. Okay. So very quickly, I I think you covered most of what we see in this slide. I think we're up to the one hour mark now. But I just want to reinforce that you believe that there's a way for us to work together with the chamber. Uh, under the current DACA proclamation to, uh, you know, get to the immigrant communities and help them become members of our workforce. But I suspect that you'd also be willing, Manuela, um, if asked to work together with the chamber under the anticipated Citizenship Act to address the skilled um, labor shortage that we have here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I think as we learn more, um, uh, I think it, it would be I would love to come back and and to talk to members of the chamber about you know how it's gonna it's gonna work, uh, what kind of industries might benefit um, with respect to labor shortages that we you know that the chamber is facing and employers are facing. Um, try to come up with some creative ways to you know to uh, solicit um, you know uh, people to apply for jobs uh, that might qualify. Um, I, I think, you know, immigration is a very, very, um, I mean, for anyone who's here, immigration is incredibly important, right? They want, they want stability, they want permanent, you know, some sort of permanency. Um, and, and for employers that are willing to say, look, we will hire you if you're the right person, but we were also going to help you through this process. And we don't know what this is going to look like, right? It may be that, you know, that you have to have an employer um, to, to, to do this. And I think that there are some things that they kind of have to work through because <coughs> right now, like if you have someone who's unauthorized on your, you know, you know, that a company has that's unauthorized, um, I get calls all the time and, and, and employers are like, well, you know, I, I know that this person's unauthorized, but I really want to help them. They're a great worker, blah, 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 blah. They've been with me for 15 years. What can we do? And my response is nothing. Right now, nothing. Because if you move forward and you file that labor certification, you're basically putting the government on notice that you know you actually have knowledge that that person is un unauthorized. And there are criminal penalties and civil penalties associated with hiring someone who is unauthorized. So we don't know if this, this you know, what this is going to look like. But if, if it gives some, you know, some comfort and some protections to employers to move forward with filing for labor certification for these people or doing or offering, you know, sponsorship in some, some respect, then yes, I think that, you know, we can definitely help. Um, I'm happy to brainstorm with, uh, you know, anyone, any in the chambers about how we could try to recruit additional people that employers might be willing to hire based on their criteria. Um, and, you know, I think that if employers are willing to say, look, we can file for you based on the U.S. Citizenship Act, and we will do that. Um, I, I think that there, there would be many, many people that would, it's all word of mouth many, many people that would be interested in, 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 in um, taking the job. Okay, so there are no more questions in the chat screen, Manuela. I know that there was a question by the Prime Bishop of the Polish National Catholic Church. I'm not sure whether that question was completely answered, but you see on your screen right now, the contact information for me and Manuela. 
And I encourage anyone on this call or anyone who you think might uh, need these services or have some of these types of questions answered to give us a call. You have the telephone numbers or send us an email and we'll be happy to talk through these issues with you. Um, Manuel, Manuel, I really wanna thank you for being here today. I know that you're, you're very busy with this kind of work. And um, even though this isn't in your backyard, it you know is sort of consistent with your international immigration practice. And yeah, so no, it was great. It was great. And I really, I really appreciate everyone being on the call today. And again, I thank you for the invitation and, you know, the chambers, thank you for hosting today. Um, I, you know, I look forward to continuing to be involved and, you know, um, letting everyone know how this is going to sort of play out in the next couple of weeks, months. Um, and I'm here. If anyone has any questions that I can answer, I'm more than happy to, to speak with you. So, um, Thank you so much. Okay, Victoria, uh, Brianna, and Tina, who are here from the chamber, thank you for hosting us today. And we look forward to answering any questions you all may have. Thank you both so much, this was great. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Right. Have a great day. Bye -bye. Thank you, bye-bye now.